Welcome to part 34 on the Lackawanna Cutoff. Paranormal activity on the cutoff. Hi, I'm Chuck Walsh, and we're here at Port Morris Yard. And this is where we're gonna be working out of for this episode, where we're going to be investigating several reports of paranormal activity, either here or on the cutoff. Now, we're gonna have three different parts to this particular episode and actually a fourth part which is going to be in a sense a summary and we're going to do some a little experimentation there but it's basically three different reports that we're going to look into. The first one is going to be with Stephen Williamson who we recorded at Roseville Tunnel in the snow. You'll, you'll find out what the significance of being in the snow is when we get to that. The second part, we're going to reprise an interview that I did with Jerry Cruz and Artie Erdman. And that, real, that, that particular interview started and really, in a sense, triggered the idea of doing this particular part on paranormal activity. And then the third part, we're going to be here at Port Morris, and I'm going to relate to you some experiences that were related, related to me by Scott Lupia. So let's first go to Roseville Tunnel and Stephen Williamson. Okay, here we are in Roseville Tunnel with our special guest who's going to tell you about his first trip. This is his second trip to Roseville Tunnel. He's going to tell you about his first trip to Roseville Tunnel. Thank you, Chuck. My name is Stephen Williamson. I am going to school for construction management. And I visited Roseville Tunnel back in 2018. It was my first visit. I came down the old right of way, which is right behind the videographer, and I walked through the tunnel past the Roseville Road overpass just to look at the retaining wall that was over there and just a few other things. And that's, the, that's actually like at least a good half a mile from this location. Yes. The tunnel's a thousand feet and then um, the, the Roseville Road overpass you refer to is close to almost a half a mile. That's right. So I did a little bit of looking there and the reason I was in Roseville Tunnel and why I visited the Lock on Cutoff to begin with was uh, I love construction. I love this type of construction which is horizontal construction if you want to call it. And I uh, watched Chuck's videos as well while I was in school and uh, I liked his content and I love railroads too. So that's why I was here. I wasn't here looking for any paranormal activity or anything like that. But as I was walking back from the tunnel, from Roseville Road through the tunnel again, I was right at this spot and I saw someone walking towards me. It was a man and he was pretty tall, he was my height. And he was wearing old work gear. It looked like it was all black, tall black boots. And uh, he was walking as almost if he had somewhere to go. And it was, he was on a mission to go somewhere. And as I'm walking out of the tunnel, he makes a left turn, and looking in that direction, it's a left turn, very abrupt, almost a 90 degree turn, and disappears out of my sight. And I thought it was a hiker, or you know, just someone everyone had a gas with their ATV. And uh, I was had to go back towards that direction anyway to hop back on the old right of way, which is the walking trail. And when I went over there, I was just curious. I wondered where this person went and what was over there. There was some kind of access road, and I'll find out later there was an access road when I watched Chuck's video from a year later. And I didn't see any footprints. No footprints, no sign of life in the woods. I mean, you know, for anyone that lives in a wooded area and there's a lot of snow, you can see right through the woods. It's bare. And there's no way that that person would have 
gone out of my sight that fast because there was a lot of snow on the ground, probably almost two feet of snow. And uh, why I decided to go that day when there's two feet of snow, don't really know. But uh, there were no footprints. There were no footprints in the snow. Now, were you the only person to have been here? In other words, were you when you walked in? Were you the only set of footprints? I believe I was the only person here. I didn't even see ATV tracks here. All I saw was animal footprints. But yeah, I was the only person here, and I was alone. So what we're going to do, we're actually going to stage this. We're going to have a, well, I'll say my son Logan, he's going to play the apparition, and we're going to basically show you what Steve said he saw that day. And while we're not trying to convince you one way or the other, uh, the fact that you didn't see any footprints is kind of, well, I like to use the example of uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and uh, Sherlock Holmes, when you're looking at it for a solution for a problem or an explanation, and what you eliminate whatever is impossible, whatever is left as an explanation, no matter how, how improbable it is, has to be your answer. So you have to think, well, if there weren't any footprints and there was a person that you saw, whether they were a person or not, what other explanation can there be other than that being some sort of paranormal activity or uh, an apparition or ghost, whatever you want to call it. Um, I know we were talking before off camera about your thoughts before you came here. I, I'm wondering, when you, when you actually walk over there, what do you get like the, the hair in the back of your head standing up when you realize that there, there are no footprints? Where, where, you know, what was what did I see? That type of thing. What, what, you know, what, what was what were you thinking or feeling at that point? Well, I was already in awe walking through this tunnel because it's it's massive and uh, you know never actually been in a tunnel before, so I was kind of already stimulated in a sense. But as I'm walking over there, I'm really not thinking about. Uh, not seeing anyone. But when I do walk over there and I don't see any footprints, I felt an eerie feeling that I really never felt before. And uh, let's just say that uh, the drive home was interesting. So it's, all this stuff is running through your mind and trying to, and it says trying to explain what you would see. Right. And that has to be quite a, an experience because it's it's like how do you explain something? That's kind of uh, and this wasn't something that you would, I mean, we, we never expect to see something like that. And, and actually, it, uh, in the I guess in the paranormal, um, you know, that uh, the people who do paranormal type of investigations, that's kind of the holy grail to see the the full what they call full body apparition. Which is kind of, uh, which is a rare thing. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to show you what, or at least what we you know, try to, as best we can, emulate what Steve saw. And, uh, you know, I'll let you be the judge, you the audience. Okay, so in this particular case, Stephen gets to meet his, his apparition, Logan. Uh, slippery? I mean, what was it like? Yeah, it was definitely slippery. Uh, wasn't too bad of a walk, but pretty good for my first uh, acting appearance. <laughs> so, when you come over to this location, what, what do you see? You don't... You, what... what, what you know, what is here, you know, what, well, was it like this? I mean, when you're looking, there's no footprints. So when I finally exited the tunnel, I walked to this spot, and the trail is just behind the videographer, but I decided to walk over here anyway to see where this person went. And uh, my first instinct wasn't to even look in the snow at the footprints. It was to look immediately in, into the woods and when I looked, I didn't really see anyone. And I don't know if you could make out on the camera that there's some homes. And I thought maybe if someone had run, 
down this trail and back into their house for some reason. But it wasn't anyone. How long was it between when you saw him turn to when you got to this spot, roughly? I would think two minutes passed by the time I was here. So it's conceivable if this was a person right. that they could have been somewhere in two minutes probably as far as that house, maybe. It's a possibility. Right. But the, the one thing is that there would be some physical sign of them having done that. Yes. And speaking because of you couldn't walk anywhere. I don't think it wouldn't make any sense for anyone to walk over here or over there. They would take this path. Exactly. And I'm looking in the woods and I'm also looking up here and it's a rock cut here. It's, you know, very steep. And I'm looking up there to see where this person had gone. Absolutely nothing. But the next thing that was running through my mind was why are there no footprints here? And the snow is probably up to here on me, up to my knee. Uh, how did this person evade my view so quickly? And there's no proof of them even being here. So that was, that was another thing I was asking myself. And when do you come to the conclusion that once you eliminate all the other possibilities that you just saw a ghost? Uh, well, I eliminated that other possibility when I realized that there is no other <laughs> place to access this right away once you go this way, eastbound, because it's on a fill for a, a long time, and there isn't any homes or anything down that way. So, But you actually saw him, th this was the location he turned. This is, this is where he turned, rough, right, roughly right here. Okay. But like Chuck said, there's a service road here for the railroad. And uh, when there was all the snow here, you couldn't even know, you wouldn't even know there was a service road here unless you were from the area. That's what made it odd to me. Interesting. And so your, your, your first trip here was a little bit, you got more for your uh, experience than you, you were expecting, I imagine, to get from, from coming here. Um, We've done a little bit of research in terms of uh, deaths that have occurred not only on the cutoff, but specifically here. There, there was a dynamite accident that occurred in December of 1910. You, you wonder, is this like an imprint of that particular event? We don't know. I mean, this, this, this uh, tunnel was part of a roughly three mile section it was actually Section 3, David W. Flickweir, his, his construction company did this, but um, he had several deaths, not just here, but uh, further in that direction. Um, but, you know, is it one of those? You know, we'll, we'll never know, of course, but um, that, that was one of the dangers of working on a construction project in 1908 and 9 and 10 and 11, um, because... Um, the accidents did happen, unfortunately, and they, they, there was, what they would do is they would blast the, uh, the rock during sort of the late afternoon, and then a second shift would take over and actually do the rock clearing at night at times. They actually, uh, in this particular section, they were under um, basically crunch time because what had happened was that they had fallen behind schedule and as a result, they'd actually, at, at, uh, for a while, were actually working nights. They'd have torches and so forth, so it was kind of crazy. I don't know if that has anything to do with what you saw here, whether that's a timeless thing, you know, in terms of, um, we don't know. I mean, whether it happened here or somewhere else and it was imprinted here, sort of, I, I don't know. I mean, paranormal activity is I, I, it's an inexact science, to say the least. But, it, you know... We, we certainly appreciate the fact that you've uh, been willing to tell us your story. This is a, a very unusual thing. And um, certainly, um, we'll certainly be looking out for other stories. We have a couple more to come, though, in this particular episode. So um, this is our story at Roosevelt Tunnel. Let's go to our next paranormal activity story. Okay, so our next part is going to be a retrospective of 
an interview I did a couple years ago with Artie Erdman and Jerry Cruz. Now to orient you, they're going to be talking about Port Morris Tower, which where we are right now is roughly somewhere be between the, the crane on the left and the telephone pole on the right, heading fairly, I'm going to say a third of a mile, that's a guess from here, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe a half mile almost. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk over here and this is the Y track, or the right of way of the Y track. And to orient you, what they're going to be talking about is going to be happening out here. And we're going to be walking over there a little bit later in the episode. But just to orient you, the tower's over there, the cutoff is in the back. We're on the Y, which kind of cuts the corner, so to speak. And then the cutoff and the Y meet over yonder, which we're going to be getting there. But just to let you know, um, two things. They, there will be a snippet where Artie is going to talk about a thunderstorm. And keep going. It, it'll make sense when we get to the second snippet where they're going to talk about two separate types of paranormal activity which have been seen not only in the cutoff but also here. So here we go to that that interview. And I was working second trick at UN this one, Port Morris this one uh, evening and we had one heck of a thunderstorm. And thunderstorms at Port Morris were interesting because the mountains around you were striated with iron ore which naturally attracted electricity and behind the tower was the uh, Jersey Central Power and Light substation. So when you sat at Port Morris you felt like you were sitting in the middle of a bullseye. So uh, You're also on t literally at the top of the mountain, so you're at you're the You're on top point. of the mountain, right. <clears throat> Reading all your stories on, on Facebook. Oh, you've been reading them? Yeah, yeah oh, I, I read them religiously. And there's a story in there about um, some very strange things happening, which involve, you know, where Andy reports them on the cutoff. You're, I, I don't know if you were... Well, on number 10, coming east on number 10, the New York Mail. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Port Morris was, uh, at night, uh, strange things would happen occasionally, <laughs> like you'd see balls of, of light yeah, down the track. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you would see lights on the end of the track, like somebody carrying a lantern across the did, track. Did, yeah. you, you saw them? Or did yeah. you hear? Really? What they were? I've never heard of this. I never knew what it was. Sort of like the... Um, the old story that I go, got go ahead. was like... In Chester Junction, where the CNJ was, there was a conductor that had an accident where he got ran over by the train and he lost his arm. The Hookerman. Yeah, Hooker. Yeah, the Hookerman. The Hookerman. That, that was down at Not Right, uh, I think, over in, uh, it'll be like Mount Olive, uh, yeah, Flanders, yeah. down there. And, uh, but I never heard of anything going on yeah, at Fort Morris. It, it, it was. So what kind the, the ghost coming back, he was carrying a lantern looking for his arm. So what, what do these things look like? I'm curious. Just like a UFO. Yeah. They were like incandescent, uh, well, they was ball-like. It was ball-like. Now, the, the Andy Barbera story, the way I, under, if my recollection is correct, involved with all sorts of strange things happening, like with the uh, signal system, and they, they saw something down like in Greendale, so it wasn't even just Port Morris, it was like something was following them? or No, what, what happened was uh, number 15 went west and number 10 would come east after they cleared. And, uh, yeah, they were mail trains. Yeah, and uh, 15 also took uh, New York State prisoners to... Uh, to Elmira, Elmira, Elmira. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting, okay. Yeah. But uh, the operator Port Morris, I won't say who <laughs> started getting indications on the cutoff. The light would light to indicate a train and it would go out. And number 10 is coming east and he's coming to Johnsonburg, well, out here. And he called Port Morris on the radio and he says, you got a train coming west. And there was nothing else around. He said, no, well, I see a light in front of me. So 
he's coming east and uh, he's going at a good clip and uh, whatever this thing was was staying ahead of him and then it disappeared by the tunnel and the operator Roosevelt tunnel, yeah. the Roosevelt tunnel and then when it the uh, number 10 came through the tunnel this thing went north and it disappeared what what year are we talking about roughly late 60s late 60s yeah. okay All right. now are there any was that an isolated thing that the, no no See, really? in Lakeland, <laughs> SC 98 ES99 I was talking to uh, he's seen them same lights on the, and he's also running over the Highbridge branch from Highbridge to Chester Junction he's seen that on the CNJ too which is the the Flan the Hookerman the Flanders thing and not right I think yeah. it was also yeah which I understand I, I, someone they the, the way I understand it, I've never seen it personally but apparently they're old employee timetables which used to have a, a note sort of a warning down there for the, the CNJ if you if any kind of light or anything at not right do not stop like as if you know as if that phenomenon whatever it was yeah had been going on for yeah. many, many years. It wasn't like this just happened. Yeah. But that's a really, I, I've never, so you're, you're saying that this this happened more than once, maybe yeah. multiple yes. times. I, yeah. I would see it, and I was only, you would like see I said, part-time, part you know. But you're, what, you're, you're, you're sitting, let's say you're sitting, you're standing in the, in the tower. Sitting in the tower on the floor. second floor. Yeah, and which way, you're looking west? I would look west, yeah. You see a light, look like somebody carrying a flashlight or a lantern. To this day, I don't know what it was. And it would be, what? Where, where would it be? Would it be down track level? Or would it track be level. Really? And the railroad's on a fill out there, too. I mean, it isn't accessible to to uh, people walk, taking a stroll. I mean, it was... But this was definitely effort. not a, like a flashlight. It was... You, it, didn't, it looked like a lantern. It was a dim light. Really? You looked at it long enough, it would move. You know, a waver, and then disappear. Yeah. What it was, I don't know. To this day, I couldn't tell you what it was. And everybody that worked Port Morris Tower has seen it. I mean, I worked with other extra men, uh, and we shared stories about the strange lights out there. Oh, you got really? Like, yeah. You got the meat to ask, add to your list, you know. I sort of like, well, what they were, we don't know. Wow. Spooks, coast, I don't know. Or, you know, it, it, I, I've, I've heard this explained that, and you're talking about the, the iron, I, I, um, I don't know if under certain circumstances it's possible that the iron deposits actually do create some kind of electrical charge, but I don't know if that's really the right, right word for it, but where you get some kind of visual phenomenon. Well, I heard it was a combination of possibly the iron ore and the um, swamp gas creating these things. Okay. So I don't know. So it wasn't necessarily like a UFO, because I mean that's the... You know, it, Except the thing Andy Barbera saw, that, that was strange. So he... he now it was, it, it was his different in a sense that from what... Well the difference was it was so bright he thought it was the headlight of a, a train coming to Greendale. Oh, okay. And it actually... The way, and it didn't make any sound, I think, if I remember no. right. So there was no sound. It was way ahead, and it, far ahead of them. And then it, but did the towerman at Port Morris also see that, or was it he, was Andy the only one who actually. No, he went? saw it when it uh, came east of Roseville Tunnel, and it came, you know, as a curve. When you, you're, when you leave Port Morris, you head north, and then you well, head fine. west to the tunnel. And uh, this thing apparently was following the railroad. And the operator at UN saw it, and then it went north. He saw it go north. Huh. And then, uh, well, that would be uh, east then. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so that's interesting that, uh, so there are multiple witnesses. So I, I, I really thought there was an isolated thing, but what you're saying is this happened, I'm going to say on a regular basis. I don't know how often we might have seen Not it. Not often, but, you know. Yeah, once in a while, yeah. You, that's, that's Everybody say there was nothing out there, but no, there, there, there was something out there. We don't know what it was. Swamp gas would be my guess, but Interesting. just the way that the humidity and the, the weather was. Yeah, the natural phenomenon. The natural that's the way phenomenon. I look at it. Okay, now here we go to the third part, and we're going to talk about the experiences that Scott Lupia related to me. I would love to have had Scott on K 
camera. Unfortunately, a while back he suffered a, an on-the-job injury, so it, that has prevented him from being, um, really being able to appear. So, but we've had quite a bit of correspondence, so I've gotten a pretty good idea of what he's experienced, and actually I'll read some of it just so it give us an idea of exactly what his words were and how he described what he experienced. He works for New Jersey Transit, so um, as an engineer, a locomotive engineer. So this, let, let's get his version of what happened to him. This would be about 10 years ago in 2012. And we're gonna focus on that white building. The, this is having to do with the fuel pad which is behind the building. We can't see it from this location where we are on the Y track, but uh, that's the approximate location. We'll show you a satellite view of that. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna read him, and it's not too long, but he, he said he was on the fuel job at Port Morris, right where we are right here. It says you take the trains from the westbound cruise, so like the train over here would be at the end of a run, let's say, for example, uh, it would be brought it would be parked here, there's a yard here, but it would be moved over to the fuel pad. Um, it says from the westbound crews as they come in and bring them to the fuel pad for fueling and inspection. Uh, then they get shoved back to the yard over here uh, for yarding overnight. And that goes on from about 6.30 p.m. to about 4 a.m. And that's basically every, every day that they're running trains. Now, he describes seeing a mist, and this is, this is what he describes. The mist I saw was somewhere around the switch for the fuel pad near the lower left of the photo, and we'll show you the photo. I had my headlight on dim, and then I saw something unusual, so I put my headlight on bright and fired up the ditch lights. The ditch lights are the lights that are down here in front of the locomotive, so you basically illuminate everything that's in front of you. That's when I saw the mist lit up and I saw the shape of a person and what looked like a lantern. The shape was soft around the edges, but I'm pretty sure it was a lantern. It moved across the tracks from left to right and then dissipated. Now this comports with some of the experiences that people have talked about with the, the hookerman, but on a different line. Uh, not here, not having to do with the cutoff, but the high bridge branch. But Scott also experienced the same thing with the, the mist or the cloud when he was engineer on a train that when he stopped at Mars Plains, that's uh, east of here on the Marstown line, the same thing happened. He saw the, the mist and then the, the man with the lantern. So that's that's two different episodes or two different experiences of the same thing. Now the other thing that Scott experienced, and he would have done what I'm about to do. He would have come. He was over here at the yard and walked down the the Y track. I'm not going to go all the way there yet. But well, that's going to be our next stop. He went over to the Y track and he saw the same light as he described it as Jerry and Artie had experienced or had seen. Scott related to me was that the light he saw originally he thought it was, he, he didn't know what it was originally. And we will go over to the Y track to try to emulate this, but what he saw, he described as somewhat like a strobe light, which he said that he didn't realize that it wasn't on the ground. He thought it was way down, but when he got over to the, the Y area, and I'm not sure how he might have seen it, it might be because in those days they had cut back the trees and also it, if it was during a time when there weren't leaves on the trees, you might be able to see something on the Y, the far end of the Y by the cutoff from this location. 
but he saw what he saw what was like a strobe light and he said it, it, it started slowly to move and then started moving faster and faster. To some degree, or I'm going to say, it, it does comport with what Jerry Cruz says, that the, the lights seem to move. Now you have to remember, though, that Jerry and Artie, at different times, of course, and, and others as well, were at the tower at quite a distance, whereas I, I believe Scott was actually fairly close when he, when he sees this light. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the Y area where it goes into the cutoff and we're going to see what we can do if it's possible, don't know, can't, don't guarantee this, but maybe it's possible to recreate something that's close to what they, uh, these different gentlemen have seen. So what you're looking at now as, it, as darkness falls is Port Morris, the Port Morris Tower area, Port Morris Junction, way in the distance. We're well over half a mile west of there, maybe three quarters of a mile almost. Off to the right is Port Morris Yard. The concrete ties are in an area between the cutoff on the left and the Y track, which when it's reinstalled by New Jersey Transit will go to the right of the, where the ties are now. As Larissa swings around to where I'm standing, I'm standing over the Muscanet Kong. And this is the approximate location of where the lights have been seen over the years. So we're quite a distance from the, the tower, but much closer to where Scott Lupia would have been. Now, I don't know that we're going to capture the light tonight, although we're going to try to, in a sense, recreate it, but we'll, we'll see how that will work. But the thing is that there's a common thread between the location here where the lights have been seen for a number of years and the light then the location on the Highbridge branch near Notright Road in Flanders, New Jersey. Now the common thread is that this is northern New Jersey. There's iron deposits all over the place. Uh, but in addition, uh, we're also in the Ramapro Fault area and to what extent that plays a role, I mean, that may be a contributing role, but it seems like the major thing is that in both locations, there is a river. Here, the Muscanetcong, the south branch of the Rabchen River at Flanders, or not right, on the Highbridge branch. Does the flowing water create some kind of energy that manifests itself as some kind of light at some point? I, 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 can't, I can't say that I don't have a scientific explanation for it, but you would think that in order for something like that orb or whatever it is, that ball of light, there has to be some kind of energy creating that. So that is essentially the explanation of the light here. Now what we're going to do is I'd like to talk about the different experiences which have been described in the different parts of this episode. To start out with, let's talk about Stephen Williamson and his experience at Roseville Tunnel. I don't see how there's any other explanation that what he saw was a ghost. The, the fact that he saw someone or something that looked like a person, and then when he went to the spot where that person walked and there are no footprints in the snow, obviously the reason why the snow was important, what other conclusion could you possibly come to that there really wasn't a person there? Now, uh, moving on from Stephen to both Artie and to Jerry, what's surprising about their report is that the the light that has been described here I didn't know about that I knew about the 
I, I would call it the UFO, which I originally thought it might have been, that Artie talked about in that particular interview. It's, it's not clear to me quite personally whether that was actually a unidentified flying object or was it another manifestation of some kind of electrical output. I use that term loosely, but it's clearly a paranormal phenomenon, but it I don't I'm not necessarily of the opinion that it was actually like a flying saucer that was brightly illuminated. I don't know. I can't I can't say I wasn't there. We don't know. It, it's possible, but my my gut feeling is that it was really a I don't know that it was related to this because you would think if that particular bright light that came up the cutoff and veered off before it got to Port Morris, you would think that if it were a phenomena related to this, only a much stronger quote unquote phenomena to be, give such a bright light, that that would have been seen more than just once over the years. My personal feeling is that what, we're, what was here was some kind of manifestation of energy, I'm probably thinking something having to do with the river beneath us that would create that. Now as far as Scott Lupia, well he also saw the light here, but he also saw that Mr. Cloud, which is really quite unique, and I don't know what to make of that. For, it to, for a cloud to actually look like a person seems to be really far-fetched. In other words, that it's just a random mist on a kind of damp night or that kind of thing. And, and usually when you have fog, fog is ubiquitous. It's not like you have isolated clouds just rolling through a rail yard. It just doesn't seem like something that you would expect to see, which makes me think that there is some kind of, it is paranormal. I don't think there's any doubt about that. What is it? Can't really say. You know, is it really a manifestation of some kind of ghost? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it, but if Scott said he saw what he saw, I, I believe that he saw what he saw. Now, what he, what is it that he saw? I, I can't say. That's that's the difficult part. Don't know. Uh, that's that's what makes the the paranormal so daunting, yet in a sense quite interesting. So that, in a sense, is my analysis of what has happened, you know, what has been reported through, through Stephen, Jerry, Artie, and Scott, what we're going to do now is see if we can possibly emulate the light. This is a tricky one because uh, different people have uh, ex really described it as it looked like a candle. Uh, I've, I've heard it described as a lantern. A strobe light, like Scott mentioned it, or just a light, a uh, flickering type of thing. So we're going to do. We'll give it our best shot. But we, I have a bag of tricks here. We're going to see what we can do. See what if any of this works. Okay. So what we're going to do is try to recreate this light that has been seen here as we lose the light. And so here we go. Let's let's see what we come up with in terms of lighting candles and putting other lights out here to see if we can see if, if we hit pay dirt. So we experimented with different light sources and the one we think worked the best was this. This is a makeshift candle in a lantern with a globe and that kind of thing. And I'm moving it around slowly and Larissa is trying to capture that and the somewhat odd effect that's being created here is because of the camera trying to focus on this light source which is what you were seeing towards the end of the video when we lost the light and the camera was trying to focus on me and wasn't doing it all the time so that's what you're seeing here it's it's we, we know this is not exactly what it would have looked like but at least we have this light here at the location approximately where we think it would be seen. So that's the end of part 34 on the Lackawanna Cutoff. Hope you've enjoyed this most unusual episode and that you'll look forward to part 35 on the Lackawanna Cutoff. <laughs>